We call the 20s roaring. The 40s were the war years. The 60s made up the decade of protest. What then do we call now? Maybe we could borrow from Dickens and call this the best of times, the worst of times. That would certainly describe the world we face when we get up each morning. Or how about the do-your-own-thing generation? Our society doesn't seem to be into rules or regulations. We don't want someone telling us what to do, or worse yet, what not to do. We want to call our own shots, do our own thing. Sometimes that makes for the best of times, sometimes the worst of times. I guess it all depends upon what our thing is and what role God plays in our choices. Hi, I'm Father Michael Tuath, and I'll be your host for What Catholics Believe About Lifestyles. In the last quarter century, the world has evolved at a pretty fast pace. In spite of all the renewal since the Second Vatican Council, we hear people say the church should get in step with the times. Possibly. Or is it possible that the times should get in step with the church? Or maybe just understanding not so much where the church stands on certain issues, but why, will present a clear perspective. We're actually concerned with God's will for us, not what we want God's will to be for us, We'll see how that plays out in the lifestyles of the righteous and faithful. As Catholics, we speak in terms of vocations, single, married, priests, and religious men and women. Let's begin with some broad aspects of these vocations as choices of lifestyle. Many religious brothers and sisters live alone in apartments or houses. Most wear secular clothes and do little that visibly separates them from people not affiliated with religious communities. So then, here's our first question. What is the fundamental difference between single life and religious life these days? Religious are considered part of the clergy, the evangelical councils. There really isn't any difference. There are more rules for religious to follow. How do you see the difference? While you're thinking it over, we'll hear from some of your fellow Catholics. There really isn't any difference. There is no difference. I don't think there is a difference. Frequently, religious are lumped generically with priests, but they're actually members of the laity and have vowed to live the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And so it's those evangelical counsels that separate them. Our expert, Sister Kathy Vetter, works closely with St. Louis Archbishop Justin Regali. The incarnate word sister is vicar for the religious in the community, serving their personal and pastoral needs. An educator, Sister Kathy taught high school for eight years and worked with young people in vocation ministry. The intended evolution of religious life since Vatican II is interior. While the visible accidentals have changed, we religious have taken the opportunities since Vatican II to rethink our goals for spiritual development, how to best serve God and develop as well-balanced Christians, bringing others with us to God. Isn't that the very question all Christians ask? All single, married, and ordained members of the church share the common invitation of God to be fully human. Vowed religious approach that invitation through the charism of their own community and the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, commonly known as the evangelical councils. Hey, wait a minute. Let's get Sister back to tell us a little about secular institutes in the church. Secular institutes are made up of persons committed to live the evangelical councils but remain actively a part of the secular world. Hopefully, their presence acts as leaven for the world. Their focus is the perfection of charity 
and evangelization of the world from within. There are also societies of apostolic life whose members don't take public vows, but who live in community and work toward perfection of charity according to their constitutions. Those of us called to active ministry have the reassurance of prayerful support from yet more committed members of the Catholic community, contemplative religious, brothers, sisters, and priests who live in monasteries, and hermits who live as individuals make an invaluable contribution to God's kingdom from which all of us draw spiritual strength. We've touched briefly on some aspects of celibacy as a lifestyle. Celibacy is one of those terms that eludes many in its meaning. So let's deviate for just a minute to define it. What is celibacy? Chastity, purity of heart, unmarried, abstinence from sex. I for sure know the answer to this one. How about you? Chastity. Means being unmarried. Unmarried. Actually, celibacy simply means unmarried. Sometimes people use it in a different context, so let's hear the explanation. Celibacy is from the Latin for unmarried. We would surely hope the other three choices, chastity, purity of heart, and abstinence, would accompany celibacy as a lifestyle. Anyone who is not currently living the sacrament of marriage is celibate. All of us, regardless of vocation of lifestyle, celibate or married, as children of God are called to a life of chastity, a moral virtue that presupposes respect for the moral and spiritual dimensions of human life. Okay, now that we've got our terminology straight, let's go on. Here's another celibacy lifestyle question. Which of these statements does not apply to the Roman Catholic Church's position on priestly celibacy? It reflects the teachings of Jesus about the urgency of the kingdom of God. It is symbolic of the eternal future to which we are all called by God. It is a sign of the minister's consecration to serve God and God's people with an undivided heart. It is a revealed truth that cannot be altered. I know what I'd say about this one. What do you think? It's a sign of the minister's consecration to serve God and God's people. It's a revealed truth that can't be altered. I think it is symbolic to the future which we're called by God. Our priestly commitment to celibacy is meant to reflect the urgency of God's kingdom. It symbolizes God's plan for eternity, and it's a sign that priests attempt to serve God and God's people with undivided hearts. But it's a law or rule based on moral principles, not a revealed truth. In the Latin rite, Priestly celibacy is a witness to God's love and action in our lives. Our priests are called to serve God through service to the church with undivided love. Their celibacy is prophetic of eternity when all relationships will be secondary to our relationship with God. It symbolizes the service to which they have consecrated their lives. When priests accept celibacy with an accepting heart, they proclaim the reign of God. The celibacy of priests is a law, not a revealed truth. Okay, so much for the celibacy vocations. Here's something that unfortunately affects almost all of us in one way or another. Which answer to the following question is not appropriate? Why is the church so strong on commitment in marriage and immovable on divorce and remarriage? The church simply cannot change this position on marriage. Once the church makes a decision, it cannot change. The marriage commitment is a sacramental one. The church sees marriage as a symbol of Christ's love for his church. Which of these do you think isn't true? The church cannot simply change its position on marriage. The church simply can't change its stance on marriage. 
Once the church makes a decision, it cannot change. The inappropriate answer here is the second one. Once the church makes a decision, it cannot change. Jesus compared his relationship with the church to that of a bridegroom with his bride. Just as Jesus promised to be with us through good times and bad, even to the end of time, the two partners reflect that commitment in the sacrament of marriage, through good times and bad, until death. Their commitment symbolizes the love of Jesus for us. Just as Jesus will never abandon his commitment to us, the church is not in a position to affirm the dissolution of a sacramental marriage and the remarriage of the divorced spouses. It's sometimes painful, but the church hasn't the power to remove what God has established. So you're probably wondering where annulment fits into all of this. Well, I think it's time for another vocabulary lesson. This one is relevant to this very question of marriage and divorce. The church, in some cases, grants an annulment to married couples. What is an annulment? Annulment is the same as divorce granted by the church instead of the state. An official statement of the church that overrides the marriage commitment. A declaration that asserts there never was a sacramental marriage. A dispensation from the laws of the church regarding marriage. There's sometimes some confusion about annulment. What does it mean to you? A divorce granted by the church and not the state. It's a declaration that asserts that there never was a sacramental marriage. I agree. A uh, dispensation from the church regarding marriage. If you chose the third answer, a declaration that asserts there never was a sacramental marriage, good for you. The church is not in a position to waive the laws of marriage or to change them. Sometimes, however, the marriage partners were incapable of making the commitment to begin with. In those cases, the church marriage tribunal may declare that the marriage is null, that a sacramental marriage never existed. Persons whose marriages have been not dissolved, but declared null and void, may enter into a sacramental marriage. No matter what vocation we choose, there are secondary lifestyles that can, depending upon how we respond to them, either deter or destroy our relationship with the God who made us for no other purpose than to love us, or they can enhance and strengthen that relationship. Let's look briefly at some of those. What does the church teach about premarital sex? It's forbidden, pure and simple. It's okay if you love someone and plan to marry in the future. It's better to live together for a while than enter a painful marriage. This is a matter of personal conscience. We certainly hear a lot of it these days. What does the church actually teach about premarital sex? Here are some thoughts from your peers. It's forbidden, pure and simple. I agree with that, it's forbidden, pure and simple. I think it's forbidden, pure and simple. The church is emphatically clear on this one. She teaches that sex outside of marriage under any condition is forbidden. It's a pretty negative way to look at it though. Actually, it's the other way around. Sex was created for and should remain specifically within the sacrament of marriage. Scripture is blunt. God's plan precludes a sexual relationship without marriage. God created the sexual union for the expression of love between two people united before God in marriage. It's the total, complete, and selfless commitment to love and share life so totally that two become one. Out of that sexual relationship comes the intensified love of the people and the possibility of procreating children for whom they are responsible. We might be tempted to ask, what's the difference? We're not hurting anyone. But that's not really true. It's kind of like carbon monoxide. We can't smell it, taste it, hear it, see it, or feel it. We can deny its presence or the danger it is to us. 
But in spite of all that, if we breathe it, it will cause us grave harm. If you think premarital sexual relationships don't hurt others, ask people who've experienced that. You may be surprised at what you hear. Our lifestyle choices need to be made with care. What about this lifestyle? Which of these statements best describes the Catholic Church's stand on homosexuality? The Church has no problem with homosexuality. The Church accepts homosexuality in some cases. The Church absolutely forbids homosexuality. The Church takes a don't ask, don't tell approach to homosexuality. This one might be a little tricky. What do you think? I think the Church strictly forbids homosexuality. I think the Church takes a don't ask, don't tell approach to homosexuality. The Church absolutely forbids homosexuality. We must always distinguish between homosexual orientation and homosexual activity. If you understood this question to mean orientation, then the right choice is the first answer. The Church has no problem with homosexual orientation. If you understood the question to mean homosexual activity, the third answer is correct. The Church forbids homosexual activity. Here's an explanation. Homosexual people should be accepted, as should all God's children, with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. These persons are called to chastity, as are we all. God created sexual union for expressing love with the bond of marriage and for the purpose of procreating children. Sacred scripture, as far back as Genesis, clearly forbids homosexual activity. Under no circumstances can it be approved. While this is difficult to live sometimes, homosexuality should be approached with prayer and a goal of self-mastery through grace. This is not a rule that can be changed, but a truth that remains intact. I know some of this is tough. It's sometimes difficult to live the gospel lifestyle. The Lord never promised us easy. He said to follow him would be to share his cross. But what a small price to pay. I has not seen nor ear heard the wonders of what God has prepared for those who love God. When the going gets tough, those words offer joyful reassurance to all Christians. Okay, let's go on. The gospel is pretty explicit about wealth and the role it plays in the overall picture of our relationship with God. What is the church's teaching on wealth? The rich have more trouble getting to heaven than most people. God innately loves the poor, but the rich must prove themselves loyal to God. God rewards faithfulness and wealth and success are visible signs of God's rewards. Having wealth isn't the problem, making it the focus of life is. What role do you think wealth, or the lack of it, plays in our relationship with God? God rewards wealth to people who deserve it. I don't think having wealth is a problem. I think if you make it the focus of your life, then it becomes a problem. I pretty much agree with that. Uh, having wealth isn't a problem, but making it the focus of life is. If you chose the last answer, having wealth isn't the problem, but making it the focus of life is, you were right on target with this one. Wealth is neither a good thing nor a bad thing unto itself. It's how we attain it and what we do with it that, as in the times of Jesus, separates the real Christians from the imitations. The only problem with wealth is that it can cause loss of focus and dictate our behavior and the direction of goals. On the other hand, wealth can generate good if we share it and put it to use in God's vineyard. The poor don't have as many choices. In their poverty, however, they have found compassion with God. Rich are poor, we are all called to poverty of spirit, to put God first in our lives, and to abandon ourselves to the providence of God who will always take care of us.
Regardless of what we have, whether it's talents, wealth, or time, we're called to stewardship, to share with each other as co-members in the body of Christ. Some social habits are so much a part of our lives that they become lifestyles. For instance, alcohol. Many religions totally forbid drinking alcohol. Catholics, however, do drink. But does the church officially forbid drinking alcohol? The church takes no stand on drinking alcohol. The church officially forbids drinking alcohol, but it's one of the rules we ignore. The church teaches moderation in alcoholic consumption. Official teaching differs from country to country according to custom. What about drinking, yay or nay? I definitely don't think the church forbids alcohol. I think they want you to use moderation. The, t the church teaches moderation in alcohol consumption. I believe the same thing. The church uh, teaches moderation because Jesus, he drank wine, so alcohol is okay. I don't believe I ever heard any type of law on alcohol consumption, so I believe there's nothing. The church encourages us to avoid excess and teaches moderation with regard to alcohol, as with all things. Here's an explanation. As Christians, we are called to the virtue of temperance or moderation in all pleasures. Through temperance, we reach a balance in the use of created goods. Therefore, the church asks that we use alcohol as well as food, tobacco, and medication in moderation. We are culpable before God for our actions when we overindulge in alcohol and endanger ourselves and others. Those who suffer from alcoholism should receive treatment for the disease and refrain from the use of alcohol. We were created by God for happiness. The good news is that happiness is very attainable for us. As a matter of fact, there are guidelines for a lifestyle that promises us that happiness for which we all search. What do we call those guidelines? The Ten Commandments, the precepts of the Church, the cardinal virtues, the Beatitudes. Makes you realize how many good helps we have to see a list like that, doesn't it? Which one is your answer? The Beatitudes. I think it's the Beatitudes. I think it's the Commandments. All of the choices are helps to living a Christian lifestyle and bring us to ultimate happiness with God. But the guidelines Jesus gave us, in which he actually promised that the outcome would be happiness, are the Beatitudes. God placed in each human heart an innate desire for true happiness. Jesus gave us hope of attaining that happiness through the paradoxical promises of the Beatitudes. Beatitudinal living affords us a vision of what awaits beyond the trials and tribulations of everyday life. The Beatitudes invite us to align our actions and attitudes to our Lord Jesus in glory of his passion and resurrection. I suggest you give yourself a little gift of joy and read these promises of happiness from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 to 12. Okay, how about a true or false question? True or false? Because Jesus said, whatever you do to my brothers and sisters, you do unto me, it is more important for Christians to live for each other than to live for themselves. True or false? Which is it? True. False. It's true. No, it isn't. It's false. It's true. <laughs> the answer is actually false. Believe it or not, the statement is not quite what it might have appeared to be at first glance. Jesus gave two commandments to sum up all of the laws. Love God with all of your mind, heart, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. By putting love for ourselves on the same level as love for others, Jesus blurred the distinction between doing unto others and doing unto self. Self-love is an important part of a Christian lifestyle. All 
of us are unique, created in the image of God. The paramount element of a Christian lifestyle is love of God. Ever mindful of that central love, we need to live in the understanding that whatever we do unto others and unto ourselves, we do unto God. Remember that little cricket that followed Pinocchio everywhere? He insisted we should always let our conscience be our guide. Conscience can be a wonderful, if somewhat persistent, part of our makeup and how we choose to live our lives. Where does conscience come from, anyway? It comes with us when we're born. It has to be developed and nurtured. We receive the faculty of conscience at baptism. God gives conscience as a gift when we reach the age of reason. Where do we get conscience? God gives conscience as a gift when we reach the age of reason. I think conscience is developed and nurtured. I think God gives conscience as a gift when we reach the age of reason. Conscience does not come naturally or automatically. So the correct answer is the second one. Conscience has to be developed and nurtured. Conscience is the ability to make right judgments between good and evil. A good conscience must be educated and nurtured. Once formed, it can help us choose the appropriate response to life situations. The education of conscience isn't a one-time experience, but a lifelong task. Through our conscience, we know good and evil, size up a situation, and apply what we know to what we experience. A conscience that is founded on a lifestyle of prayer and faith guarantees inner freedom and peace of heart. While we may want the church to change on some of these issues, we must always keep in mind the purpose for which we were created. Doing what feels good and having someone justify it isn't that purpose. God wants us to be happy joy-filled, but God doesn't want us to do whatever we feel like doing and petition our church to tell us it's all right. That isn't truth. And even if the church says it's all right, it wouldn't change the reality of what God has revealed. You can take the battery out of the smoke alarm because the noise is driving you crazy, but that doesn't mean the kitchen isn't on fire. Whether we accept it or not, whether we know it or not, some things do tremendous good. Some things cause immense destruction. Parents hopefully do what they believe is right, even if it isn't what their children want. Parents usually know better. God does know better. Our responsibility for that good and evil has to do with what we know of the truth and how we respond to that truth. Only God can or should judge us. Only God knows what's in our hearts. Hopefully, that's the joy of answering the invitation of Jesus, recorded at both the beginning and end of John's Gospel. Follow me, he said compellingly. That's quite an invitation. Thank you for being with us. As we go our separate ways to live our chosen lifestyles, let's ponder these words from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I hope to see you next time for What Catholics Believe. Okay. <laughs> yes, and he does it. He does it his way. It's Sinatra's world. We only live in it. <laughs> you look fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> Let's rub my chin. Mm, mm, mm. Chinny chin chin. Okay. Le mariage. 
sacramental. 